Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody watching the 304 Podcast here on Facebook and on YouTube. Guys, if you're watching for the first time, please go ahead and hit that like on Facebook, share it, follow YouTube, hit the notification button, and subscribe. Please support us. Sammy, how are you doing tonight, buddy? Pretty good, man. Did you have a good day, good Monday? Uh, it, as as good as a, as a Monday could get, yes. I'm, yeah. Well, we've been looking forward to this all, you know, for the last couple of weeks, and oh, it's man. finally here. Uh, finally here. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, we won't keep him waiting any longer. Our guest tonight needs a little yeah. introduction. Uh, head coach at Clemson University from '99 to 2008. Uh, the son of the great Bobby Bowden. He played at West Virginia from '73 to '76. Uh, began his coaching career at WVU in '77. Um, his career, we've seen him win uh, Conference USA Coach of the Year, two-time ACC Coach of the Year, and uh, the FCA Football Coach of the Year. Everybody, please welcome in the great Tommy Bowden. Yes, sir. Hello, man. Hey, Coach. About, hey, Coach. Time I, now, when I saw when I heard I was going to be on something with 304, I said, I need to be on 304. That's my home, more or less. Yes, Second home, yes, anyway. Sir. We yes, really sir. appreciate you coming on. You know, this is big for us, you know, uh, with what we're trying to do here at 304 and uh, what we're trying to build. And we're trying to, you know, educate the youngsters coming out of high school on what it takes to get to that next level and what it takes to be to achieve and, and to do all the things that they need to do. There's a lot of hidden talent down here uh, and we want to expose that talent to the world. Well, it's, it's you know, it's a, I, I went to junior high, high school, college there, and uh, my wife from there. And I've been going back to Morgantown for over 50 years straight, every wow. year for over 50 years until COVID hit. And I'm going back right. this summer for my 50th high school reunion. So uh, oh, looking wow. forward to getting back up that way. But uh, 304 means a lot, not only to me, but to the whole Bowden family, my father especially. So uh, appreciate y'all having me on. Uh, fun fact for you, Coach, actually. Um... If I'm if I'm not mistaken, your dad, while coaching at West Virginia, was my uncle's Sunday school teacher. <laughs> you know, now he a lot of people. I, I, I do a lot of Christian speaking. And I did a lot with my father when he was living, but uh, and I would tell that I said he was. He was my Sunday school teacher, and I'd say I said I didn't say he's a good Sunday school teacher, but he was my Sunday school teacher. <laughs> That's All awesome. I do is, you know, Sunday well, morning he's there teaching Sunday school. Yeah, well, my uncle Don told me that. I said, "You got to be kidding me! Are you really?" <laughs> yeah, he's I thought not that lying. was no. I, I thought that was really lying. cool. <laughs> nope. Again, and my uncle Don still lives in uh, Morgantown. What's his last name? <laughs> Oliver. What's his last name? Don Oliver. Yeah. Well, I was in Sunday school with him. We was probably acting up, me and him. Probably. <laughs> probably <laughs> yeah i hope i hope my dad's watching right now it'd be pretty cool man i, I told him that i was uh we were able to book you and he's like no way i gotta i gotta talk to your uncle I'm like, all right so yeah no thank you for coming on coach seriously thank you very much i'm gonna start off with uh with with this uh tonight coach in your book you know um the winning winning character you plot a game plan for life that will make any man successful now you refer to them as uh, the acronym cards could you go over those for all of our young viewers and talk about how they are applied in life and in football well you know i spent 32 years of coaching 12 years as a head coach and and I bounced around for 19 years as an assistant trying to, you know, position myself to get a head coach job. And I felt like if I ever became a head coach, if I could just get my players to make good decisions, pick up the paper nowadays or the internet and Google your favorite team, you know, young guys are making bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. So I said, okay, if making good decisions will help me be successful and them, what characteristics are associated with, 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 with making good decisions. And, and I felt like, uh, you know, uh, let me get my hand in the picture here. Uh, commitment, accountability, responsibility, discipline, sacrifice, those five things, which the acronym spells cards, uh, commitment, accountability, responsibility, uh, discipline, sacrifice. Biggest ones, accountability, responsibility, decisions have consequences. And, 
So uh, not only players make bad decisions, coaches have made bad decisions, politicians, lawyers, doctors. So that was kind of the the characteristics I thought needed to make good decisions were those five things. Uh, And that's absolutely, you know, the truth. You know, we see a lack of, you know, as I see it, a lack of accountability uh, more so than anything nowadays. You know, people do things on a whim and then don't want to take accountability for their actions. and. Um, I think as as the world kind of moves forward, we see that becoming more and more of a of a I don't want to call it a flaw, but I guess it is a flaw of in, in decision the decision making process. Um, so I think you know that that acronym there, really there, stuck out no, to me. No, no well, the acronym really stuck out it's, to me because it's, 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 it's go ahead. Yeah, it's like you said. You know, the longer you coach. Yeah, and you hit on just a little bit or touched on it, but, the, you know, the those things used to be taught at home. The, the commitment, accountability, responsibility, discipline, sacrifice, you teach them at home. But you know as well as I do, the family unit, traditional family unit, nuclear family unit, biological father, mother in the home is no longer, it's just it's, it's as dysfunctional as ever. Uh, cancel culture has got the, the, the family unit, as we know it, uh, under attack. And uh, 40 years ago, I started recruiting and, Going to a home is very common for mother and father to come to the door and you go in there and talk to their son. Their mother and father, father's peppering you with questions. And then uh, 35 years ago, less of the fathers. 30 years ago, less of the fathers. Uh, so the, the family unit where they used to be taught the characteristics that we've been talking about uh, is no longer taught at home. So it's the coaches, uh, a lot of times a coach's responsibility to try to initiate some of those characteristics into, into their players. Hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and it makes you kind of look at the era of, of football that we're in now when it comes to especially college football, you know, um, with the the emergence of like the NIL and the portal and all of that stuff, you know, and, and my question there is, you know, how do, how do coaches and, and programs maintain integrity throughout the, you know, the NIL and the portal coming to fruition? Like, it seems like it's missing a little bit. Yeah, I tell you, it's really, really going to be hard. A, a college coach, I think, I, and I did an interview with somebody the other day. I think it was out in Las Vegas and talking about a similar topic. And I think, uh, I think, it's, I think Sports Illustrator, somebody was interviewing him. And, and I think one of the difficult things now is you're going to see more college coaches burn out. Of course, their salaries, they're going to be able to burn out because their salaries are so high, they can afford to get out of it. But I think you see a lot of more people retire. And I, I got out of coaching at 54. And I think you're going to see more coaches not only get out, but maybe drive them to the NFL because of the things that you just mentioned. The uh, transfer portal uh, decisions have consequences. Well, the, not in the transfer portal. You get yelled at. You're late for practice. Something goes wrong. You get benched. You make a mistake. You make a bad decision. They'll take off on you. So uh, it's really making it difficult for some of those things we just talked about, those characteristics to be, to be implemented. But uh, it's made the coaching profession very, very difficult. Yeah, because yeah, especially that portal, the portal's weird because uh, there needs to be a stipulation on it too. I, I like it in the fact that let's say your coach goes to another, and because a lot of players go to teams because of a certain coach, and uh, if that coach ends up going somewhere, you know that player can can go into the transfer portal and, and follow that coach. That's good, but the, a lot of it you may see they they may run into some kind of controversy or it's just not what they like or not that what they thought it was going to be and just use it to, to, to shop around, I guess, in, in a way. And, yeah. and I think you're going to see, there's a lot of, a lot of diversity you're going to see with the, with the transfer portal. Uh, I, th- I think it's good, but you, you see, you'll see a lot of bad with it too. Just like the, just like the NIL. <laughs> oh, yeah, there, there, there's no doubt. You know, you, you go back, at, you know, if you look at my father's career, my father had a, uh, has got an NCAA record, which may never be broken. That was 14 top five finishes. Not so much 10 win seasons, but top five finishes. I wow. think uh, six or eight is the record now. But if you take those 14 seasons and look at his seven quarterbacks, every one of the seven quarterbacks started as a red shirt junior and red shirt senior. Charlie Ward won the Heisman. I mean, Chris Winkie won the Heisman. Casey Welton came in second. Uh, Danny Canal, Danny Manis. Peter, Tom Willis, I can go on through seven, but had the transfer portal been in effect back then, those guys have been gone. He would have never had the success 
that he had if the transfer portal. So uh, there's a lot of negative to it, but uh, yeah. it, it has changed the, the landscape of college football, the, those two things, more than any can think of. Yeah. Do you think there's any way back? Do you think that we're we're do you think we're already over the edge, or do you think there's a way back? I don't know. It's going. You know, I, unfortunately, years several twenty thirty years ago, I'd say twenty five years ago, mm-hmm. and talking with I remember talking to Jackie Sherrill and, and Philip Fulmer, and talking specifically, they could see down the road, and I agreed with them. I've said it several times that the 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 Power five conferences, five power five conferences. Each one just says he's got 12 teams at, at 60 teams. They felt 25, 30 years ago, those 60 teams are going to pull away and, and, and pull away from NCAA, form their own conference, get their own commissioner, and, and then go play college football. And I think that's what's going to happen. I think those 60 teams are going to pull away, get their own commissioner, and, uh, and, and they're going to have to find some way to have some guidelines and regulations and rules about the transfer portal, when, and then the NIL, they got to have a cap on the money. I mean, some schools got so much money, and, and uh, the phrase buying players, that, that's, that, that's happening. Uh, you can mm-hmm. show the as much, but they're, they're being bought. Sure. Well, and it also makes you wonder how a lot of these um, NFL guys, you know, the NFL players, say I'm a starting quarterback for – the Falcons and they draft another quarterback who got more NIL money in college than I got in my first three years of rookie, you know, rookie, my rookie contract. Why would I ever help him develop? Like, like I think you're going to see some resentment going down from the NFL back into college. Yeah. I I don't think there's any doubt. And and I'll give you an example. I don't know this is fact. I I did a, a television show for the ACC about nine years and I've always followed Clemson since I've coached there for so long. And I watched their quarterback, uh, DJ. Y'all say his last name. I can't say his last name. I just call him we, DJ. Yeah, but we can't say it either. <laughs> from West Virginia, you're going to struggle with it too. I know. Oh, no, 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 no. That's a... <laughs> yeah. Unless it's Hatfield or McCoy, y'all going to struggle with it. <laughs> but, but I think he had signed like, I want to say 800000 a huge deal with Dr. Pepper before his the year he started. Now, he started right. those two games right. his freshman year, Notre Dame and somebody else, he played tremendous. Then all of a sudden, he got that deal. And, and I don't know this for a fact. I'm just trying to think the thing that you just mentioned. If he goes in last year, he had a very average year. How much animosity was there in that locker room? Offensive lineman, second team quarterback, wide receiver, tailback, defensive lineman, saying, hey, this guy's getting all this money. He's not playing that good. So I could see a little bit of uh, – possibly uh, jealousy in the locker room. And I don't know if that happened. I, I'm not there day-to-day like Dabo is. If I was there day-to-day, I'd have a better feel. But uh, that that one was hard to explain. But I don't know that some of the things you just mentioned, a little bit of jealousy from the other players, was not a factor. Well, and, I, and I'm going to give a shout-out to uh, Mark Fain. It's uh, Oyangalele. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. You unga I can't. I, you got it. Yeah. He, well, he he taught me how to say it, so I've I've, I've kind of got it down. I had to had to <laughs> get my mouth good and wet so that southern twang didn't pop out and make me say something else. <laughs> yeah, poor poor Mark yeah. wanted to be on the show uh, to to meet you, Coach, but I told him he couldn't because he didn't meet the height requirements for the show. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, okay, well, we love you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> guys if you're just watching uh we're here with uh, coach tommy bowden and if you have if you have any questions whatsoever go ahead and throw them in the comment box and we will get to them as soon as we can all right coach coming from a long and storied family of coaches what coaching philosophies have you watched that stand the test of time and those that haven't well you know i was speaking somewhere the other day and talking about I don't know, fundamentals, foundations of the country. And I was comparing it to what I used to hear my father say. I played for him at West Virginia. I was a young coach for him at Florida State. And you say, what, what, what passes the test of time? What stays? And he used to say two things. He said, say, man, it's nothing more than blocking and tackling, blocking and tackling. He would say, and I'm sitting there as a young player, young coach, say, hey, give me them plays. I want to see them great offensive plays drawn up and diagram that's going to beat any defense. But that's not what you learn. You learn more 
what he just said, the fundamentals that doesn't change with a test of time is if you can teach those guys fundamentally to be sound uh, offensively, uh, blocking and tackling, block and pass protection, run, run, run scheme, and then defensively and tackling, then you're going to be success. And you've got to dedicate individual time. Every coordinator wants team time when you get to practice. You're getting up and lining up with 11 bodies and all that, but if they neglect, you know, 20 minutes of individual tackling every day or, or, or blocking techniques and all that. So the fundamentals, I think, is one of the things that we get away from, especially with the RPOs and the sophisticated offenses have gotten with running quarterbacks backs and and things like that but uh, i think the thing that has stood the test of time is the, is the blocking and tackling and, and the individual time going into those fundamentals no that's good well and that's you know me and tim you know we've coached you know middle school and and you know a little bit here and there and that was something that we always really focused on especially with the little kids you know is the fundamentals and it's so funny because we struggled to get the parents on board <laughs> with just learning <laughs> the fundamentals. You know, they oh, want to yeah. win. They want little Jimmy to score and, to, you know, to, to, but the fundamentals is what makes that happen. And, and, you know, it, we struggled to get them to, to understand that. Um, I'm sure, you know, college ball, it's not the same way, but I mean, it, it's, it's something that, like you said, it stands the test of time. Yeah. You, you deal with parents not as much as you do at, at, at that age, but you still, you still deal with them. And they, you know, unfortunately, often I've always been a play caller and, and, and involved offensive skill, but there's, you know, there's, there's one football and five eligible receivers and they all want the one ball. Everybody wants it. If you throw it to the yeah. split end, the flanker wants it, give it to the tailback, the fullback wants it, throw it to the flanker, the tight end wants it, you know, and, and, so uh, they all won't start. That's where the girls are, you know, you get your name in the paper and all that. But uh, <laughs> it's, the, it's the big uglies, the offensive line, defensive line, where you, you know, kind of make your team up there with the bucking and the tackling. That's probably the most important foundation of a team. Of course, my dad would come in with this question. <laughs> he, he wants to know, would you ever coach at Ohio State? <laughs> <laughs> they got a pretty good guy at Ohio State. I don't know. They do. Oh, that, that guy, it's hard to do better than what he's done. He, but that's a good place. I mean, you know, I, I, was, I spent a lot of time at Urban Meyer and uh, know that he had success up there. And Ryan Day would be another reason he had success. Great school. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I was born a Buckeye, and most of our family have lived up there, like South Carolina, Ohio, and uh, that's why you see Eddie George's jersey behind me. It's my Ohio State stuff. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we kind of bleed the, the scarlet and gray. <laughs> I'm going up to Columbus in uh, August, I think, to speak at some some Christian functions, but I'm okay. headed, headed, up, headed up that way to speak in, uh, I think, August. I forget the date, but it's sometime in August. Sweet. See if we can find some Christians up there in Columbus. I know. There's a few. There's a few. But they're there. Ah, <laughs> uh, most of them are Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, well, you, might get some mail, you might get some emails on that. I just can't. No, that's okay. No, no you're right. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, we'll change gears just a little bit. You know, something we communicate with our channel and with our audience is what – uh, young men and women that are hoping to play college ball, what it takes to actually play at the next level. What does it actually take? Um, what do you did you instill in your players to help them understand the difficulties of being a a student athlete? <laughs> well, it's funny you should use that word student athlete because <laughs> that's what every coach says, but they want them athletes. If it's student thing is. is they always say student first. Students in there, but it's it's a it's a distant set because you keep your job by winning, and you keep and you win by getting getting the best players. But uh, uh, speaking about like we talked uh, to those players, commitment, accountability, responsibility, those type things. But usually, if you find players that that have some of those characteristics, you got a lot better chance to have success because they're going to make good decisions as far as getting in trouble and being at practice and being on time. Uh, you got to have you know you. I remember going in high schools and recruiting, you know, when I was assistant, even a head coach. And, you know, you you definitely go look at character. 
you go look to the first stop is usually the guidance counselor to check on their grades and see if they're taking the right classes. And then you go check with his teammates and other coaches and teachers and see how his, how his character is. So yeah, care, character is important, but if they've got great character and they're not any good, you're not going to win. Now, if they're real, real good and don't have any character, they're not going to be there. So you got to find some way to, to, Find the guys that have them both. They're, they are out there. I had a coach tell me one time when I was recruiting a big old great-looking defensive end, and I was an assistant, and I told the head coach who was watching him play basketball. It was wintertime. The football season's over. And we're sitting up there in the stands, and, man, he's a six foot five, two 235 pounds, running down the court, dunking. I said, now, coach, I said, now, he's a great athlete, but I said, uh, he's got some, you know, he does have some character issues. He said, well, you know, I'll never forget. He said, you know, some of your job is correcting character, which it is as a, as a coach. You're, you, so uh, you do got to take a chance on some of those guys and say, hey, my job as a coach to teach, to, to te- is to teach character. But uh, they got to be great players. The team, you look at who win, who's winning games right now the most. Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State, Clemson, Oklahoma. M- Mike can throw Texas a But those five schools – have been in the top five in recruiting in the last 10 years. They get the best players. They get great players. And uh, you got to keep them. So when you say, hey, what's it take to have? you got to be a great player. Now, there's there's ways to achieve those skills in high school we can talk about, but they got to be a really good player. Yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, we have uh, Mark Fang comes in with a question real quick. He wants to know, uh, what what's your favorite game you have ever coached? You know, somebody asked me that the other day, and 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 there there would have been, you know, maybe two or three. One of them had to be at Tulane. We went undefeated. There was a, a game we played against Louisville, and uh, they were, had a guy named Redmond that was a quarterback, really good player. They had better players than we did, but we beat them on the last second to go undefeated in 1998. Go to Clemson, and then uh, uh, played Florida State. I had lost to Florida State uh, my first four years. Years and I said, man, we gotta we gotta beat these guys. I remember the AD called me in and said, hey, we hired you to beat Florida State. Yeah, we beat your dad now. And so I I got my attention. We won four out of five, and then they called him in and said, hey, we hired you to beat your son Clemson. So they ended up hiring us both. <laughs> hey, said so we'll take it. We'll fire both of you. But the, one of the biggest games was uh, playing Florida State. They were number three in the nation, and we upset them. Was it was a huge win for us because when I took the Clemson job, they had not scored a touchdown, not much less one. They hadn't st- scored a touchdown in Tallahassee. Clemson had hmm. in ten years. Wow! Five trips. I said, man, I'm gonna beat them. They ain't scored a touchdown. So beating them when they were national rank was a big win. And then one time with my my rival, uh, the rivalry at South at uh, Clemson in South Carolina, uh, yeah. Coach Holtz and I got the job at the same time. And uh, we played them one year and beat them 63 to 17 at Columbia. <laughs> and uh, right after, it was a week or two after I beat my father at Florida State. So uh, that those three, the, the, the Tulane, the uh, Louisville when I was at Tulane, uh, beating Florida State there third in the nation. And I think that went over uh, South Carolina. Because when you win like that over an in-state rivalry, you can pretty much get the players that you want in the, in the state anyway, because because you kind of swung the pendulum in your favor. Sure. I guess coaching and beating your dad like that had that had to have been like bittersweet. Well, it, it, it was, you know, the first year we played the call to Bowden Bowl ESPN. Uh, it was, a you know, uh, never been done in the history of college football, all kind of media there. And it was a huge game. We lost uh, 17 to 14. And then I lost the next three. He killed me. I mean, it was just a massacre. <laughs> and then we had to, we, we, you know, my mother, of course, my, oh my, I got five siblings. They were all for my father. He's got the credit card and he had the money at the time. So <laughs> my mother knew whether who, who signed the bill. So she, and plus she was sleeping with the head coach at Florida State. So she wanted him. Now, all my siblings, he was probably in his late 60s, early 70s when I was coaching. So they knew he was on the bottom, back end. I was on, the, hopefully, on the front end. So they were kind of – they favored him. All my family favored my father in all our games, especially when I started winning. When I won four out of the last five <laughs> years, my mother, my mother wouldn't let me in the house. <laughs> the Thanksgiving dinners was was totally just like, no. No, nah, no, nah, yeah, I ate, I ate a little kid's table. 
they put the little kids out. That's the table I eat at. Thanksgiving. I got a sandwich. They were eating turkey and dressing. That's a table with my father. And my Don't wife, you ever do it again. And my wife and children, we were, yeah, we were eating sandwiches at the small table. <laughs> well, I mean, it's funny because, like, you know, looking looking at your dad, like people's dad, you know, like a, a man looks at his dad, and like your dad's like, you know, always bigger and stronger and smarter, and like, like when when you pe- played him that first time, did he have any? And I'm just gonna ask because I'm curious. Did he have like any comments? Like, did he just pat you on the back and say, eh, "Better luck next time," or did he have something smart that he said? Like any dad? <laughs> well, would have? no, he, he did. He did say something that was, you know, helpful. I knew it at the time, but, you know, after the game, uh, of course, you ain't got about 10 or 15 seconds because he goes in there and talks to his team and flies back to Tallahassee. I got to go talk to my team. Both have press conferences. So you got about a 10 or 15 second conversation, and there's a bunch of people out there, media around you. I remember we met out there. He, we were ahead 14 to 3. He went undefeated that year, won the national championship. I had him 14 to 3 at halftime. I said, but I knew I played for him and coached for him. I, I knew what he was telling those guys. They were a lot better uh, players than what we had at the t- time. But he ended up beating us 17 to 14. So we'll go out there and meet uh, in, at the, in the middle of the field after the game. All the media is around. So he pulled me up close and put his kind of whisper in my ear. He said, son, he says, you better go recruiting. <laughs> and uh, that's what I did. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but, yeah, that's what he said right after the game. I'll never forget it. And that's what I did. I got better players and eventually beat him. But it, but he, he knew that uh, you do a good, solid job of coaching. The team – everybody does a pretty solid job of coaching. It's just that the guys were the best players that make plays. Leave guy on sure. block, tailbacks make somebody's miss. Wide receiver goes up over a small defensive back. And, you know, just the great players so, – he said, son, you better go recruiting. And that's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's, that's, that's classic. Epic. I love it. Yeah, Coach, what? Uh, first of all, I got to say hi to my son, Ben. Hey, buddy. He's watching. Hey, buddy. I love you. Um, what What tips would you give kids and parents that are still in high school about the, the nature of recruiting and selecting where to play college sports? You know, a couple of things. Number one, I would encourage them to play multiple sports. Don't get locked into, you know, a lot of time a, a coach or a basketball coach or a football coach or, you know, one of them will get a baseball coach and say, hey, just, you know, spend time with us and, and work all year on your sport and, and your skill set in this particular sport. Number one, I, I would recommend them uh, to play as many sports as they can. College coaches love to see the athleticism involved with, with other sports. And, and then the other thing, don't feel like you have to, if you're at a, say a small 1A school, don't feel like you have to transfer to a, to a larger school to, to get seen, as they say. College mm-hmm. coaches can find you, especially with, a, with, the, with the media uh, huddle. They've got so many uh, high school venues right now from a, a, a media standpoint where college coaches will find you. So if you're any good, that they, they will find you. So I would say number one, play multiple sports. If you, and usually uh, a, a Division One A prospect is the best player on that team. He usually plays multiple sports or has the talent to play basketball, baseball, track, or wrestling or whatever. Play multiple sports. Don't feel like you have to transfer. Uh, and then uh, the better grades you make, the more opportunities you have. The Ivy Leagues might be a factor. Some of these Division One A, Division Two schools are a little more academic oriented. Uh, uh, so the better grades you make, uh, the more opportunities you're going to have. So I'd say those three things. And, and, and then it's, 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 uh, the, the high schools is they're working year round now, you know, mm, in multiple yeah. sports, some of them football, there's, a, there's a lot of football programs that are in, in, in that are working year round. So there's a year round commitment. If you want to be good at your particular sport, especially for football. Well, that's a good segue. We had a question from Chris Parrish. He says, if you had to coach a different sport, which sport would you be, would you coach? Well, oh gosh. You know, I ran track in high school. It Track would be, I, I probably want something with a team concept that involves strategy, like basketball. Now, there's only five basketball players. There's twice as many football players, a little more. X's and O's are a little more difficult in football and basketball. It would probably be, probably be basketball, maybe even baseball. 
a, but something with a team concept as opposed to track as individual, tennis as individual, golf as individual. I'm, I'm more inclined to be to, to, to favor team sports where, 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 where people really have to, you know, uh, they really have to sometimes have to put their skill set on the back burner, you know, and, and let somebody else get the limelight offensive line as opposed to tailbacks and quarterbacks and wide receivers and things like that. So uh, it probably would have been basketball or, or baseball. Okay. And, and talking about coaching anyway, coaching kids, my wife earlier came in with this, with this question. What would you like to see? Uh, what do you like to see mostly out of your players that play for you? Oh, uh, effort, effort, muscle. You know, how fast does the motor run? When the motor, the motor needs to run at 10. Every, every snap. I think uh, they've take, done studies. The average football play lasts about, uh, I think, four seconds, five seconds. Mm-hmm. Take 70 plays. I, I don't think it's but about four minutes or five minutes. So that's not very that's not very long. A football, a three-hour game, you know, kind of capsuled into four or five minutes. So to me, I love to see effort and hustle. Just, just tremendous. You know, football is a game of energy, emotion, enthusiasm, effort. It's a loud sport. I yeah. coach wide receivers, and you got one wide receiver that's running post, and he's 30 yards down the field. Other one's running out. They're on both sides of the field. You got the second team going up there. They're getting ready to go. You got some guy trying to get lined up. You're yelling way down the field. Hey, you did this. <laughs> you, you know, you're trying to coach them, and you got to yell. You, your, your voice has got to project 30 or 40 yards. So, football is, is a loud sport. Uh, golf, they put up signs that keep you quiet when you get ready to right. you know, right. get, get a golf shot. It's a little different. So, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a loud sport. But if I can get guys just to play hard, turn on mm-hmm. the film, and, and they, do they play hard and with great effort, that, that would be, the, to me, the, the number one thing to try to get your team to do. And, and that's what Urban Meyer says in the, in the book I read, uh, Above the Line. And he said exactly that. You got each play, you got in between four to six, four to six seconds. That's what you got. And, and, you know, you go back to Bob Latticer in California, you know, I, I don't want you to be perfect, but I want you to give a perfect effort during those four to six seconds. The effort needs to be perfect. So, yeah, I, I can see where that's a, the main thing you would look for in players. Yeah, my father used to use a couple of phrases, as a player and a young coach around, him, you know, about, about effort. He, he, he used to say, if you make a mistake, make it full speed. So, you know, just make it, just go, go full speed. And then he used to, I've had some of his ex-players remember this one. He used to say, hit through the echo of the whistle. So if you're running to hit somebody and they blow the whistle, you keep going until the echo of the whistle <laughs> stops. You know, that's okay. real. Finally dies down. And a lot of people don't realize he was, when he, a lot of times when he won the, he won the national championship or, or came in or lost it, he was the most team in the ACC I don't know how many years because I was coaching and I said man you hear so much about penalties man heavily penalized teams you got to play smart you're not going to win any game his team were but they were cold-blooded killers they were late hits hits on the quarterback hitting out of bounds you know they were penalties of aggression which I can coach that I can coach penalties of aggression if a guy's running down the sideline you run across the field and he steps out of bounds by six inches and you just knock his head off (laughs) <laughs> you, know, you bring them over there. And you bring them over and talk to them a little bit, and give them twenty five dollars, and you say, "Hey, now don't do this again." <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes you know, sometimes you know, like those those kinds of hits and players, like that sets the tone of the game. I'll never forget when, I, when it was in middle school. Um, we were we were playing one of the better teams down here, uh, the Bluefield the Bluefield Beavers, uh, in middle school. And uh, they come out and lined off as the first play of the game. And they come out in a shotgun. And I told my nose guard, I'm like, jump off sides <laughs> and just just destroy that center. I'm like, just jump off sides, destroy the center. I said, I'm going to yell at you and, and, you know, make it a show. I'm like, but you're good. And so first play of the game, Brandon, <laughs> he jumps off sides. He hits that center, knocks him flat on his butt. And I told him, I'm like, now the next play, pick the ball up and run it in for a touchdown. He looked at him, look at me like I was crazy, and I'm like, no, I'm like he's gonna throw the ball over his head. Sure enough, threw the ball over his head. He didn't get it, but somebody else did. It's funny how like that that can set the tone. Oh yeah, you know, those, no, those no, aggressive hits. Football is a football is a game of mo- mo- it's it's a get football is a game of momentum changes. You know, it's, it's sixty minutes long. Somebody's gonna return a kick 
or, or block a punt or there's going to be a great hit or, 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 or great catch that's going to change the momentum, then something else is going to change the momentum. And I hate to tell you, I, I was in college coaching and told my players do the same thing. <laughs> I started a game like that one time. Yeah. I said, you go knocked up. I'll take the five yards. Offside, it was an offside penalty. You know, I said, that very first play, you knocked the fire out of them. Out of, we'll take the five yards and go play the rest of the game. But uh, So I hate to say that I've done the same thing, which is, you know, that is questionable from a sportsmanship standpoint. I do want you to know that. You know, that's kind right. of like questionable. Oh, but I did it too. And I'm a Christian. Well, guy. absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Well, and the thing is, I grew up, you know, I played center from Little League all the way into high school. I've had it done to me, and I know what it does, how it gets in your head. And, you know, I was like, we're going to need that edge to beat this team. I mean, we're going to need it. And so, you know, just took what had been done to me and reciprocated it to some poor other <laughs> child. And <laughs> I don't I don't regret it. <laughs> well, you always – you know, you, you always try to do that with a quarterback. I can remember my, as a young coach, again, for my father, and they'd be playing Florida when Steve Spurrier was there. He used to, Spurrier used to complain, but they would beat the fire of that quarterback. They would hit him low, hit him hit him late. And t- I mean, back then the rules were a little bit different. You could just obliterate a quarterback, and they did. And Spurrier would complain, and Florida State would keep winning. So, uh, you know, there's some, there is some merit to getting in a quarterback's head. You know, he instead of looking downfield, he's going to be peripheral vision. He's going to be feeling the outside pressure, or when he sees a linebacker blitz or defensive end coming off the edge, you know, he'll see that and focus on that. His eyes just for a split second, instead of being downfield, will be on something he shouldn't be. So that 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 def, there's a mental aspect to the game of physical intimidation. It, you know, it's a it's a physically intimidating sport. A lot of people say, well, you know, football is a a uh, contact sport. Basketball is a contact sport. Dancing is a contact sport. Football is a collision sport. And, and uh, it's a different guy that likes collisions. You know, that's not, that's not normal. So uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit different mentality. Hmm. Well, I know we touched a little bit on the NIL and the portal. Um, and something that I've kicked around as an idea is that as all of that develops and plays out, a lot of high school kids are going to maybe not get the opportunities that they should because, you know, some coaches may want to go into the portal and get a sophomore that's got a year of college experience as opposed to bringing in, you know, maybe a three-star, you know, tackle or something that they're just not sure about. Do you think that that, that, do you think that that's a possibility? Um, I know because you also spoke about, you know, when, when you're picking your schools, you know, look at smaller schools too. I think, the future is going to be in some of these smaller schools because wherever the talent is, you're going to get eyes on you, right? Oh, yeah, and, and you're right. It, it's it's definitely going to affect high school athletes, and and it'll it'll never affect the great athlete. But there's only a handful of those great five star guys. The rest of them are three or two or one or or whatever. So yeah, the, the going to a school and getting a a, a lineman that has started in college in division one, a, and, and played in the power five school and started six or seven games as opposed to high school, three-star junior, that's going to maybe take two or three years to develop. And as a head coach, you know, I ain't got two or three years. I'm, I need to be successful next year. So uh, it's definitely going to hurt uh, some of those high school players. They're not going to be given the opportunity because of the transfer portal. Absolutely. I agree totally. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, here, you know, with three or four athletics, we feel like uh, exposure is definitely going to be the key for high school players in the future. And, and that's that's what we – again, that's what we do here and, and and through the podcast. As a coach, what what are some ways kids can get exposure to improve their chances at a, obtaining scholarships for them in the future? Well, uh, you know, a lot of them, you know, the camps now, it's really coaches. They want to put an eyeball on you. They, 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 want, they want to see you change direction, jump, accelerate, catch, you know, whatever. You, they want to see it with their own eyes. So if these high school athletes can, can get, on, get on campus. Now, they don't need to go for those three-day camps. You know, a lot of them have the one-day camp now. So, you know, it's not very much. Uh, it's, it's always, you know, I remember 
you know, as the football coach and having our Clemson camp. And you're always aware of what South Carolina charges, what Georgia char- charges, Auburn charges and all that. So you, 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 you'll be very competitive. But if these young players in high school can get to a camp or two, <clears throat> and, and not only will they be seen or coaches like, but it'll also it, it also improves their skill. You know, they do learn some things fundamentally that are really, really good teaching points and, and it'll improve their skill set in a camp. But if you're talking about how, how can I get noticed, what can I do? One of the things, go let the coach put a set of eyes on you and get, so get, get on their campus and get in their camp is more than anything. And then I always felt like, you know, from, you know, when I watched tape as a head coach on a high school player, I just kind of let the tape go. And I figured if a guy's any good, he'll do it more than once. If he's a great running back, he'll make more than one. I don't need to run that run back. He should be making a bunch of them, you know, if he's a right. Division one a player or defensive lineman or offensive lineman. So uh, on Friday nights in high school, uh, other than going to camps, you, you better show out. You better show out, and you better be a dominant player in, in high school to get to the next level because there's a bunch of dominant high school players at the next level. So try to get to camps. That's one way. And then when you do play, and the best thing, coaches, you know, if coaches look at – you're talking about these high school guys. What can I do? And we talked about – we hit on it earlier. When, when you're a high school player and they kick it off, your motor better run full speed. It's not it's so if, if you just play with great effort and intensity, that gets their attention because a player at 15, 16, 17 years old, a lot of time doesn't understand the intensity and energy involved at the next level, the collegiate level. And if there's if there's signs that you know how to play that way in high school, it, it goes a long way. And be honest with you, that's got nothing to do with talent. How, your energy and your enthusiasm, your effort and your intensity has nothing to do with talent. So that's something that every one of you are listening. If you've got any high school guys listening, that's something every one of them do, regardless of how many stars there are, how big, how fast, how strong, uh, uh, and, uh, effort and intensity is uh, anybody can do it. Hmm. That's good stuff, Absolutely. Coach. Yeah, absolutely. Well, guys, this is the 304 podcast here on Facebook and YouTube. Be sure to click that like button and share. We're on with Coach Tommy Bowden. If you have questions, we'll get to them in a minute. We're kind of at the point where we're just going to ask you just some kind of uh, questions that, that maybe been submitted by people prior to the podcast or things that we're personally curious about. So we'll just kind of start with those. Some of them will be quick questions. So, <laughs> but Put, put uh, Coach Palmer's uh, comment up there. <laughs> I mean, he goes, it, it's a local coach here at Graham High School, um, Coach Bowden. He says, I'm looking to hire a coach. Ask Coach Bowden, does he does he want to come out of retirement? <laughs> I, just, I just saw where Dan Mullen took that offensive coordinator job at that high school down here, wherever he's in Gainer, in Shoremore in Georgia. So, uh, oh, really? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, now, he's got to, he, I hope he realizes the salaries have gone up now. So, if he's paying, <laughs> I'll come. I tell you what, Co- Coach Palmer, he's got a good, uh, a good team over there, and uh, he establishes a great culture there with Graham High School. Um, Where is that? What it, city? What city are you talking? About? It, Bluefield, what Virginia. Oh, oh, Virginia. Right, or West is, Virginia? Uh, Virginia, just just right on the other side. Okay. okay, I didn't know there was a Bluefield. I knew there's a Bluefield, West Virginia. They were what? Uh, were they state champ? No, they lost the. Yeah. They, they're state champions, definitely, yeah. But um, yeah. but he he's got he's got a great program over there, and he's a very very good coach. Oh, huh. okay. Well, uh, I think let's see. That, <laughs> well, I think I think the big I think the Big Twelve ought to look at you for their new commissioner. Ah, ooh. <laughs> yeah. Just throwing that out there. Now, yeah, they uh, they they got problems out in the Big Twelve. Mm. <laughs> they do. <laughs> they, they do. Okay, let's uh, uh, let's go with those questions here, Sammy. Okay, Coach, what was it like playing at WVU in the seventies with the great Bobby Bowden at the helm? <laughs> you know, I tell you what, you know, back then the games changed so much. You had uh, we were a two wide receiver offense at that time, and I don't know how, how much y'all know about the the history of West Virginia, but when I first walked on, I was I played at Morgantown High School, had to walk on. I wasn't wasn't very big, and ended up earning a scholarship. And starting but it, it took me several years 
when I went there, there was a, a, one of the, maybe one of the best wide receivers you've ever been in the history. Had he played these offenses, a guy named Danny Bugs, it was an NFL player, but played at West Virginia, a guy named Marshall Mills, some other, they had some great wide receivers. So, uh, but there was only two, there's only two positions, a flanker and a split in. And so it was really, really competitive back when I walked on and was trying to play. And my fa father had always said that you're not going to have to be equal to the scholarship players. You're going to have to be a little bit better. I, I got to have a reason to justify putting you in as my son. If you're not, at least you got to be better. You can't be equal. I, I'll play the guy that I got money invested in. So, uh, uh, you know, the, the old Mountaineer field, 36,500, you know, fans, lucky, if you're lucky, right on top of you. It was a great environment, but back then, 36,000 was a, was a decent crowd. And, and, yeah. and it was a, you didn't know, you know, the big stadiums and what they had now. The facilities were nothing, you know, so uh, it was kind of back where, uh, as you mentioned earlier, that it was it, there were truly student athletes. You know, <laughs> you used to go to class and all that. So it was a different, different game, but uh, uh, it was a uh, I enjoyed. Like you said, playing for my father was fun. We won. Yeah, you know, it's always it's always helpful if you win. The first year I started for him, uh, we went to the Peach Bowl and uh, we, we we were winning, and I was playing, and we were winning, so there, there was no criticism. So uh, it, it was it was a great year. The next year I played for a guy named Frank Cignetti, uh, who was the head coach. We weren't as successful, but uh, winning's all – football's always fun, always fun as a player, whether you played in the 70s, 80s, or 90s, if you're winning. It's a great – great same way with coaching. It's fun if you win. It's not if you lose. Yeah. Yeah, our buddy Brent but, but Bell back, out of South but, Carolina. But, but, Back then, all you did is blocked as wide receivers. You know, I mean, you didn't catching wasn't a big deal. It's you had two of them, and you're predominantly probably 65, 70 percent run, maybe seventy five percent run. So all you did, I was like an ankle biter. I just went out there and you know, dove <laughs> your ankles, rolled them up. So I wasn't maybe one hundred and sixty pounds. I was like a little rattlesnake and bite them in the ankle, and I'd I'd get out of there. Our our boy Brent Bell from South Carolina chimes in saying he he loves you, coach, and thanks for the childhood memories down there at Clemson. <laughs> That's great. Spent ten good years there. I coached Dabo as a player at uh, West Virginia. He played wide receiver, and I was coaching wide receivers. I hired him at Clemson, and uh, of course, recommended him when I left. And he's done a great job. But uh, yeah, uh, I'm sure that guy's pretty happy with how Dabo's doing too. <laughs> <laughs> when did you know that you wanted to be a coach? You know, I wrote a I wrote a autobiography in sixth grade. And and uh, no, on your you had to write it on yourself, autobiography on yourself. And uh, I wrote that I wanted to be a college coach. And uh, my father at the time was a college coach. Had my father been a high school coach, then I would have been a I would probably have been a high school coach. But he went right into college. I wanted to go right into college. So uh, back in gosh sixth grade, I was probably probably 12, 11, 12, 13 years old. I knew that I wanted to go into college coaching. And uh, so uh, I, I knew early. My brother Terry, you know, who was a head coach, head coach at Auburn, he went to law school after college. Then he kind of made his mind up. But I knew at a young age that's what I was going to do and set out set out to do it. That's cool. That's cool. What's one piece of advice you would give your players that all kids need to hear? Oh, man, alive. You know, <laughs> the, the, the biggest thing would be uh, football – is going to last, I think, 3% of players make it to the pros. So there's a life after football. And in college, they need, they need to prepare for that. And it, and, it, and, it, and it deals with making decisions other than an academic decisions, going to class and making good grades. It, it also involves, you know, how, how you treat people, involvement in the community, and, and seeing, seeing what an influence. You know, college players have a tremendous platform. They're, they're a tremendous influence. And uh, I used to try to tell these players, you know, I, you know, being a Christian coach, after we play on Saturday, I'd talk to the team. I said, listen, man, I says, y'all got to, I know your parents come in, but man, if, if y'all could get to church on Sunday, if you can get to church, you have no idea how many young guys are in church. And they see you walk in the door as a player at Clemson, for example. So the influence and the impact, the platform that a player has, they really don't have a concept on. And I try to stress to them, the importance 
of, of doing the right thing, not only on the field in the classroom, but socially, you know, at night. Uh, that's when a lot, I get that phone call. If I ever, head coach ever gets a phone call after 11, it, it ain't good. <laughs> right. it's good. It's your sports information director telling you, uh, coach, there's going to be an article in the paper in the morning that such and such got caught doing, you know, got caught with an open can and they found marijuana or girlfriend's pregnant or pushed a girl or got in a fight and you beat up several guys, you know, there's going to be something. So I tried to talk to my players. I said, man, you've got to make good decisions, not only in football, but in your academic life, your social life, how you represent the university, your realm of influence as a player, you just don't understand. So I, I try to get that across to them, how, how people they could influence as a, as a, as a player. Yeah, that's good. Chris Parrish asks, um, with coach, coaching being so time-consuming, what advice would you give to a young coach with a family? Uh, well, you know, that, that's because I figured out coaches, I, I, as a coach, I probably spent between 95, 90, I probably spent between 90 and 105 hours per week. Mm. These are very little time for your family. Uh, in the fall, hardly any time spring if you're going to see your family it better be spring a little bit better than summer so if if you're a young coach i would encourage you not so much to spend uh, quantity time but quality time with your family uh and then uh my father said son when i started interviewing for head coaching jobs he said son you need to have your i've got a a, a nice very attractive wife but she also knew how to be a co- head coach's wife She'd been around my mother. We dated for seven years through uh, high school and college. So she had seen my mother be a head coach's wife. She knew how to be, be one. So I would tell a young coach, make sure your wife understands the commitment that you have as a, as a coach. Because what will happen, you'll raise everybody's children other than your own. You end up mm-hmm. raising 85 mm-hmm. teenagers. And all of a sudden, your family, you, 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 they're not your emphasis. So, number one, the little time that you have with your family, make sure it is, it is quality time. You're not going to get the, you know, I don't know, you know, birthdays, soccer games, basketball. I never went to those. Uh, trick-or-treating, you can't, go to, you can't go to those things as a, as a college coach anyway. Now, high school coach, right. you might can. So, spend, to me, spend quality time and then make sure your wife understands what you're getting into. And I had a great wife. And I remember we're talking to the AD about Dabo. I said, Dabo's got a great wife. I, I knew his wife, Kathleen. She was a great head coach's wife. Because coach's wives, in, in college anyway, they're very instrumental in, in recruiting. Because a lot of these guys, they only have a mother. They, they're a single parent. Their mother's with them on the official trip. They're closest to their mother. So mm-hmm. a lot of the, the prospects, parents want to see a, 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 a motherly influence. And a head coach's wife can do that. And then a, a head coach's wife, even in high school, can, can be very helpful for him. So that would probably be those two things, quality time and, and educate your wife. Who inspired you the most, Coach, as a young athlete? You know, young athlete, you know, I wasn't a very good athlete. I had to work so hard just to earn a scholarship, then eventually get to start and play. And, you know, I was five foot nine, hundred and well, I probably walked on 150. I think I, I got on the scales after we played Syracuse and I played the whole game. I think I weighed 158 pounds. So <laughs> I didn't really look at, you know, great athletes and, 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 and say, gosh, I'd like to be. I knew I wasn't going to be that type of guy. I had to play smart. I had to get good, great energy, catch the ball, those things. Like that. So I really didn't have anybody I looked up to. Now I had a coach, that one particular coach, where I learned a bunch of football off of. But as a player, I really didn't guys, – I, guys, I, I like a guy named Steve Largent. Remember Steve Largent? He oh, yeah. Receiver played with Seattle Seahawks. He's about my size, and I used to kind of like watching him. Blitnikoff played at Florida State. He was a lot bigger than I was. He wasn't very fast, but I kind of liked watching him. But Largent and Blitnikoff would be NFL guys that I watched. But uh, they were – Blitnikoff was bigger. So I didn't really have any college players that I tried to – imitate but uh, i did have some college college play up uh, guys that I, I tried to watch who's the best athlete that you've ever coached 
Oh man, wow. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it, it might have been a guy named CJ Spiller at Clemson. Ooh, he was number yeah. one pick for the Buffalo, maybe the, the tenth pick overall in the draft. But he was a great tailback. Could have played wide receiver, could have played defensive back, could have played safety, kick return, punt returner. He was he was a, a just a great skill type of athlete. And I coached another guy at Clemson. You might not remember the, the name because he passed away at 26. He was playing in the NFL of enlarged heart. A guy named Gaines Adams. He played defensive end at me. He was the fourth pick overall uh, in the first round. Went to the Tampa Bay Bucks. He died at 26 of an enlarged heart. But he's about six foot four, six foot five, two hundred. I signed him out of high school. He played eight man football, played wide receiver, hmm. six four, six five, two hundred fifteen pounds, but just very athletic, and grew into a great defensive end. Could rush the passer, and just a tremendous athlete. But those would probably be top guys that I, I coached at, at the country. Yeah, Spiller was a heck of a running back. One of the viewers yeah. asks, "What what players in the NFL do you enjoy watching?" You know, I like Tom Brady because he produces. He's older. He's going against the odds. He's acute, he's accomplishing things that, that are abnormal. They're not normal. Yeah, you're things. right. Think, you know, anybody that that gets anybody anybody that's coached. You see a guy in the 40s, early 40s, being as productive as he is, and then being an offensive skill guy and, and coordinator for so long, calling plays, being around the offense. I I kind of migrate toward offensive guys as. Uh, that I study and watch, but he would be the one guy in the pros. that just, he's a phenomenal. He's just, he's a generational type guy. And uh, I, I'm glad he's coming back for one more year. I'm anxious to see what he does, but he, he would be the guy. I kind of like quarterbacks. I've always kind of liked Russell Wilson because I was coaching at Clemson and we just finished competing against Phillip Rivers. And that Phillip Rivers came in as a freshman, most unorthodox throw motion, <laughs> but he, man, was he good. Editor, tough, hard nosed guy. We might have beat him three out of four years. I was so glad to see him graduate from NC State. He finally left. And then I'm out there in pregame the next year. We're playing NC State up there at Clemson. And I'm feeling, and I see this quarterback for NC State, and he's throwing darts. He's throwing bullets, and he's accurate. He is right. I said, who the heck is this guy? So we just lost Phillip Rivers. And there was that dag on Russell Wilson, and he was he was next in line. I said, "Holy smoke, this guy good!" So uh, <laughs> I like I like to watch Russell Wilson too. He's just six foot, yeah. you know, five eleven, six foot, maybe six one. It's got the game's difficult for him because of his size. So I, I really like watching him. Smart player. What about what about the one that got away? What's the one player that you thought <laughs> you had gotten recruited that you thought was coming to Clemson and just slip through your fingers that just is still a little bit painful. Golly, boy, I've had one or two of those, you know. There were some guys that, that I was recruiting from. Let me see if I can think of them. Of course, my father, you know, when I went to Clemson, they were the they were the dominant team in the nation. So he'd come in the daggone South Carolina and steal all my good layers. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but one that I thought that I would get – Spiller was a fight down to the wall with my father. Uh, you know, we had a chance for Tim Tebow. Uh, he had visited a couple of times, even though his father went to Florida. And uh, uh, I, I didn't know if we had a real good chance to get him. But, you know, the one that sticks out of my head is C.J. Spiller because he was Florida. He wore number 28, same number as Wart Dunn. We just happened to, to, get, to get him. But uh, I lost my share of them. One of them doesn't stick out, but. I sure lost plenty of them to a bunch of coaches. <laughs> and I guess and back to the let's go back to the famous Bowden Bowl real quick. Uh, All right. I think we harped on this, didn't we, Sammy? What what was what is it like? I yeah. guess I guess we 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 covered it. What was what it was like to, to coach against your dad? So I think we covered that. Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, but my wife earlier did come. She did ask. Um, about your dad, what was your favorite uh, saying your dad would always say? 
Say, uh, you you froze for just a second. Repeat that. Say that one Sorry. more time. Sorry. Uh, uh, the question from Christine Oliver. She she wants to know what what was one of your dad's favorite sayings that always stuck with you that he would always say. Oh man, you know the one that he gets. I mentioned or the one that at least players make fun of all the time is that hit through the echo, <laughs> hit through the echo of the whistle. Because <laughs> when you think about that, you know that's that's right borderline uh, late hit. It really is a late hit if if you do it, but uh, uh, that and uh, you know the 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 one thing that yeah I, coming from a Christian background and we talked about him being a Sunday school teacher being a godly Christian man and I did a lot of Christian speaking with him after he retired and I retired we did a lot of speaking together, but he he he's made one statement and and it's not so much as it relates to coaching as it does to life especially from a Christian perspective, but he made, he, he would always make the statement. He said that uh, he would say that God does not want your ability. Uh, God wants your availability. If you just mm-hmm. make yourself available to him, he'll, he'll, he'll find a way to use you. And uh, I always, always thought that I, I do a lot of speaking now. And, and then I'm just trying to, just trying to say yes, as much as I can. God, God will do the rest. And, and then there was another say, and it wasn't football related, but since your wife asked the question, might be uh, it might be more helpful for her. He made a statement. He would always talk about you know doing the things to, to get to heaven from a salvation standpoint. And he always said, he always said, I know I'm going to heaven, but I'm not homesick. You know, he don't want to go tomorrow, but he, <laughs> right. knew, he knew he was going. <laughs> so, uh, so I like that. Always making a preparation to put himself in, in the in the into heaven's gates, but uh, those would be two that they're not so much football specific as they are more from a Christian perspective, trying, trying to live a godly life. Yeah. Yeah. So how many times a day would your dad say dad gum? Oh man, a lot. He said, all <laughs> you know, I can honestly say, I can honestly say <laughs> as a Christian guy, I'm not sitting here lying to you. I think I could talk, just pick out how many times I heard him curse, say a cuss word as a player or as a coach un- under five times. I can tell you wow. in college. Two of them, we were playing Boston College my junior year up in Boston, getting beat pretty bad. And he came in at halftime and said a cuss word. And then the other one, I, I, he cussed so little. You know, when you can remember a guy, he lived to, he lived to be 91. So, yeah. you know, you can remember two cuss words. That's, you know, you don't cuss very much. But we were playing, uh, we were playing Pittsburgh. No, no, I was at, no, he was at Florida State. I was a young graduate assistant. And we were playing Pittsburgh. You remember uh, one of their head coaches named Foge Fazio? Do you remember that name at all? No, I don't. Okay, well, after Jackie Sherrill left, I think Foge, F-O-G-E, Foge Fazio, F-A-Z-O, got the head coaching job at Pitt. Jackie Sherrill left some really good players. And Florida State had played Pitt about every year back then. I remember one time he was motivating the team on Friday night. Friday night was his big motivational talk. He was getting after him, and, t- and he's just, you know, talking, talking strong. It wasn't cursing. And then he he said something about Fo Foge Fazio, and the beginning word was F. <laughs> 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 kind of went along with Foge Fazio, if you can know what I'm talking about. And and yes. he already, he never said. That's the only time I ever heard him say that word. But. Uh, that's only two times I've heard him curse. He just didn't, you know, he wasn't a cussing type of guy. And uh, like I said, I, and I, I wasn't either. You know, I just, uh, there's ways to get around, you know. It, it, it's kind of, it's, it's a sport, to be honest with you. If you're looking at motion and energy and enthusiasm and effort, and it's a loud sport, and uh, it's, it's, it's kind of hard not to do that. But uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's possible. And, uh, but I've tried, I've tried to watch my, my language along with him, but, but I learned that from him. Yeah, that, that's awesome, Coach. We're going to get to a few, just a few more questions, Coach, before we wrap this up. Um, All right. oh, yeah, your, the next question is yours, Sammy. Well, Kenneth Hill says it's nice to know that people still believe in mm-hmm. God. Thanks for the comment, Kenneth, and thanks for the like. We appreciate yeah, you stopping in. Um, of, of your coaching accolades, um, which one are you the most proud of? Oh man, let's see. I'm speaking strictly secular now, not not anything faith based. 
I think I coached for 11 and a half years. And I think won 90 games, which, you know, that's when I first started coaching, we only played 11 games. We didn't play 12. We didn't have a championship game. So, uh, you know, having some, some success uh, in the coaching profession was really helpful. And as a head, going undefeated, you know, my father's been undefeated. Terry's been undefeated. I've been undefeated. Uh, we're the winningest family. Uh, the Archie, the Manning family, as far as players, have, have track records you can't beat. But as far as the coaching profession, I think Terry and my father and I, we've got over 600 wins, which is, I don't know who the second, not a second. I don't know. Gosh. Uh, coaching family, as far as Holtz, Skip Holtz and Lou Holtz would have, uh, I don't know, maybe two or 300. We'd probably have twice as many uh, wins as they would. But, uh, I think uh, just from a from a secular standpoint, productivity, it would be, you know, uh, I think that's win two, lose one, win two, lose one. It'd be about 12 years of eight and fours, which is not great, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough profession to win in. So I'd say going undefeated would be my biggest accolade. That's whether you're at Tulane or at Auburn or Florida State or Ohio State or Alabama. Going undefeated, it's, it's tough to do. So yeah, that would probably be my one that stood out more than any. Gosh, we got a lot of people chiming in now. Uh, Coach Brent Bell wants to know. I, he, w- I would love to know if Coach would talk about the Rod Gardner catch. <laughs> I was on, a, I was on one of these things last week, and so somebody asked me about that <laughs> catch. You got to probably be a Clemson fan to know what he's talking about. But I had a receiver. My first three years at Clemson, I had one guy drafted. You know, George had fifteen this year. I had one and three years so the cupboard was a little bare but the one guy was rod gardner who was a wide receiver six foot six foot three and a half maybe 215 pounds he was really really good playing south carolina in clemson down by two yeah i know it's it, yeah down by two field goal wins it about the 45 yard no, no about the we're about 50 yards away and we sprint out one way and throw back to him you know, trying to isolate him on the corner get the safety out of the game so we sprint out throwback quarterback named Woody Dancer and South Carolina fans accused Rod of pushing off, which he didn't push off, just a little horse play down there between a wide receiver and defensive back. He caught the ball, called timeout, kicked the field goal, and won the game. But that was Rod <laughs> Gardner. And Clemson people, South Carolina people know about that catch in that game, but uh, no, but none of the other listeners might not know about it. But Rod Gardner was the guy. I talked to him maybe about a year ago, played in the NFL, number one. He was a so one team, their first pick was the second round, and he was that guy. So he was a first rounder, kind of first pick of the second round. But the team only had their first pick. And I forget who that team. Well, I think it was Washington Redskins. Yeah, that yeah I was going. I was going to say he, he, he played, played for the Redskins. Yeah, yeah, played his whole career there. The great, great, great person, great wide receivers. Still have a good relationship with him. <laughs> That's awesome, man. See, I'm looking. I'm reading the questions to make sure. We yeah, don't I'm reading miss the questions too. Anything we haven't talked because we've hit on a lot of these guys. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to my last question while you yeah, do go that. With, Sammy. Go with your um, last question because I, 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 that's one of the best questions that, that I think is on here. And uh, that's a good question. Everybody, if you if you but, if you have questions, guys, go ahead and leave them, and we'll get to them right after this one. Uh, you know. As a Christian uh, man and a husband and a father myself, Coach, uh, you know, talk about the spirituality of football and how sports increases spirituality awareness. Well, you know, if 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 being successful about making good decisions, and so as a coach, you're always looking for resources. How can I help my players? NCAA restricts the amount of time with them. They hold you accountable. NCAA holds you accountable twenty four seven, but they don't let you have them twenty four seven. They disbanded dorms. You know, they had to be 50-50 with students. So they've kind of taken away that little supervision. They have curfew, and they're all out all over the campus. So as a coach, you're looking for resources that would, that, that, that help you uh, uh, teach players commitment, accountability, responsibility, discipline, sacrifice. And as I studied the Bible and studied Jesus Christ, I looked at the life of Jesus Christ and say, well, committed, accountability, responsibility, discipline, sacrifice. So from a Christian perspective, uh, and the Bible, uh, going to church, Church is not a not a place of perfect people, but it's people trying to make good decisions, learning those characteristics. So I tried to implement Christianity as much as I could because the Bible is a book about making good decisions, teaches you commitment, accountability, responsibility, discipline, sacrifice. So 
uh, teach them to, to get actively involved in reading the Bible. I always was a big uh, uh, supporter of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. It's an organization yeah. self-explanatory. Uh, I pushed that real heavy with my players. I took my team to church once a year, tried to get them involved with the local church. Most of them had a member of their family. I recruited the Bible Belt. Uh, I know there's Christians up in the Northeast and other places, but I've always coached pretty much in the Bible Belt in the Southeast. And so there, there would always be a member of one of my prospects' family that was a committed Christian. So they would, I wouldn't get any, any battles if I took my team to church. So I would take them to the church, try to get them involved in the local church, get around people that make good decisions. So between FCA, church, Bible, uh, praying with my team, uh, that aspect of Christianity I thought could help me as a coach. I, I did it for selfish reasons too, other than the fact that you're going to maybe give them an opportunity for eternal life through a relationship with Christ. Uh, it was also things that would help them be a good husband, a good father, uh, a, a good solid citizen and make good decisions. So the Christian aspect, I thought taught the things, commitment, accountability, responsibility, discipline, sacrifice, Jesus Christ, the Bible, the church, FCA. Uh, it helped me and it helped them. So that's, that's why I thought it was important because it would teach those five things. And those are some resources that I tried to use knowing that as a head coach, the NCAA limits and restricts my time. Yeah, and and no matter, you know, it's funny because no matter where, whether it's regular day life, you're a football coach, um, just or your family, you know, God positions us for a, a in a position of for impact wherever we go, and, and especially as a football coach because you can instill things in them that they've probably never seen before. Uh, without having to force, uh, you know, the Jesus thing down their throat. Because we, we don't want to do that, but we want to live the life in front of them to make them see that, hey, there, it's a different life and, and, and making a life of making good decisions. And then, like I said, being placed in a position for impact and just making a difference. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with what you said. You could coach for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, you know, it's so interesting to think, about how coaches really impact a young man's life because we all have those those lessons that we learn from specific coaches that resound in us from middle school, little league, middle school, high school into adulthood. And like, you know, that, that's something that I think a lot of parents miss when their kids are young is that that their their kids are picking up things from their coach that th that kid's going to apply to their life. And it's never – it's so rewarding when you run into one of your players and they bring up something that you said that that imp is impacting their life 20 years out. You know, I mean, it's it's just – it's – that's – I think that's the greatest re reward as a coach you can you can ever have is, is for a kid to say, you know, this really has helped me through life. Yeah, there's and, – and like I said, longer coach, of course, you hear that. Uh, often when they had the, my father's funeral services, you know, we had five services in four days in two different states. But you heard that as Derek Brooks got up to talk, Warwick Dunn got up to talk, Charlie Ward got up to talk, Deion Sanders got up to talk, Mark Rick. You heard that about my father, the impact that he, he made other than football. They did not talk football. They didn't talk a specific game or a national championship. They talked about the things that you just mentioned. And uh, coaching is about leadership. What is leadership? Leadership is influence. So uh, the influence that you have, the platform that you have is unbelievable as a, as a coach. I think it's Billy Graham that said a, a coach will impact more players in one year than most people will in a lifetime. <laughs> Simply yeah. because you're around, you know, you're, I'm, I'm around 85 guys uh, every, every year. And, and like what, like one of your dad's books, you know, it's, it's titled, it's more than just a game, this whole thing, man. It's just, uh, because I, it's been a while since I read that book. I need to read it again. But it's, it's this everything is life. It's more than just the game. Well, you know, you talk about uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the importance of family, and uh, you know, for for having an influential father that makes an impact in your life. It's that's how it's been done thousands of years, and and uh, so uh, leaving a legacy for your children and mm -hmm. uh, is. A, Coach, it's in your your players are your children. So uh, that's that's the way it used to be done. That's the way it should be done as a as a father uh, and as a husband and as a coach for your children. You know, you you should make an impact. It should be a positive impact. So it's awful important. It is. 
Kenneth Hill says, I think it's, it's a coach's responsibility to help them get through life, and you're amazing, Tommy. Thank you. Well, uh, no, Christine. Figured, was, sorry, I, go ahead. Sorry. I always, always figured that, uh, you know, being a Christian at some point in time, I, I am going to heaven, and, and God's going to look at me and say, okay, Tommy, I'll let you become the head coach at uh, uh, Tulane December the 6th, 1996. Every year you're a head coach, you had 85 players in front of you. You had 85 players. He's going to look at me, God will look at me, he's going to say, hey, did you mention my name? Uh, could they see me through you? Did you tell them about me? Now, I have to answer that because I was a head coach and I had that opportunity. So uh, uh, all coaches at least are going to have to answer that, you know, one way or the other. Even husbands and fathers, but uh, special sure. specific coaches and talking about it. Hmm. Christine asked, "Did you ever want to coach in the NFL, or did you have, ever have the opportunity to coach in the NFL?" You know, I, I never did. I never pursued it. If you pursue it, you can usually do it, but I just never pursued it. Uh, probably the reason was my father never pursued it. You know, I felt like I could be more of an impact. Uh, yeah, as a college coach at that age. Uh, getting them right out of high school from a character standpoint and, 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 and do, doing the things. The NFL is so much business, you know, where the players make more than the coaches and owners going to fire a coach before they'll fire a player because the player makes more. So I always felt there's a little, not much, not, not much more secure, but a little more secure <laughs> in college. And I just felt like my talent level was more acclimated to, to college as far as making an impact, impact is on the things that we just mentioned. It would be more impactful in college than pros. Yeah, plus those pro athletes don't listen to you anyway. <laughs> Heck no. No, they make too much money. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, guys, we've we've been on for, uh, you know, an hour and 20 yeah, minutes. Long, we don't want to take up any, any more of Coach uh, Bowden's time. Um, we really appreciate you coming on. I mean, it's been a an awesome time here yeah. listening to you talk and, you know, I've, I've taken away a lot of uh, good advice and, uh, you know, it's nice to sometimes uh, think people are putting your way to kind of give you a gut check on certain things. And I, I appreciate that from my end. And we would love to have you again, uh, have you on again sometime in the future, coach, if that's okay with you. Yeah, let's do it. Once the season kicks off, let's, let's, let's uh, get back home. Maybe talk a little football, some other things. Heck yeah. But, uh, yeah. I got your number. Uh, and, and, you know, as a, <laughs> Ex college coach, I really appreciate what y'all are doing. You know, y'all are having a y'all are having an opportunity to impact players at, at a very influential stage of their life, and grade school, high school, and you know, looking to make that next leap. Leap. So, uh, uh, given a uh, having a platform where those guys can can listen in on conversations like this, and maybe pick up one or two things that y'all are discussing. So, appreciate what y'all do for for youth and sports uh, in today's time. Oh. Well, we, well, we appreciate, appreciate you. that. <laughs> well, you, guys, don't, you don't know how much. I mean, I keep saying it. I keep harping on it. It's like, thank you, thank you, thank you, because uh, <laughs> this has been this has been very um, uh, informational for us and, and just awesome and things we can just take we can take snippets of and just and, and, and make great things out of. We just thank you for again to taking the time. I, we know you're a busy guy and and doing this for us. Well, 304. When I saw 304, I was going to do it once I tied that into West Virginia. So uh, enjoyed being on. Let's do it again, and I uh, hope you all have a good weekend. Yes, sir. You too, Coach. Well, guys, uh, this is Tim, even... T Tim, Sam, and Coach Bowden. We're going <laughs> to sign off the 304 right. podcast. Everybody have a good evening, and thanks for tuning in. Later, guys. See you all. Thank you, man.